This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. T. Last week, we at the Word of the Week paid tribute to a hot beverage that has been singularly responsible for nearly every script we've ever written, along with the designs of countless fantasy role-playing games and video games. That was coffee. But when we submitted the script to our producer for review and production, it was pointed out to us that, you know, not everyone drinks coffee. We said we knew this, but that we knew that a third of our American audience did, in fact, drink coffee. Statistically. It was pointed out to us that, yes, America is the largest consumer of coffee in the world. But surprisingly, it isn't the whole world. And there are a lot of other hot beverages. And, well, look, it went on for a while. He lost. Uh Uh-huh. But the point is, we had to agree to talk about tea for the next episode. And the next episode is here. This one. And further, our producer was insistent that we give tea as fair a shake as coffee. That was probably in response to a comment that may have escaped our lips describing tea as flavorless swill, made from dissolving compost in water. That's, That's hurtful, you know. That's, that's very, very hurtful. Very hurtful. So, in the interest of not letting tea be the thing that ruins our podcasting relationship as it helped ruin the relationship between England and America, we're going to discuss tea. Politely. So, tea. Look, we made a point last week of telling you how popular coffee was in the world. Well, in the interest of fairness... We have to admit that tea is the second most widely consumed beverage in the entire world. It is surpassed only by water. And and what's in tea? Uh-huh. Water. That's right. Yep. Yep, that's water. So it might as well be the first most popular drink in the entire world. 158 million Americans report drinking tea at least one serving a day. And America is the second largest importer of tea worldwide. America imports 519 million pounds of tea products. The only country that imports more tea is Russia. But the thing is, if you balance it for population, Americans don't even make the top 10 tea-consuming countries in the world. The number one slot for the most tea consumed per person in the world is... Turkey. Yes, the folks who basically turned coffee into a social and cultural phenomenon and brought it to the entire world. They drink the most tea in the world. Per person. Filthy, tea-swilling trait. Hey, hey, you promised. That's right, you promised. Isn't that interesting? And what's even more interesting is that worldwide, three cups of tea are consumed for every one cup of coffee. So if you make this a worldwide popularity contest instead of a what's actually better contest, uh, excuse me, tea wins hands down. Yay for tea. Someone give tea a medal. And don't go accusing tea of cheating just because it boosts its numbers by also being very popular as a cold beverage. Because no one's ever heard of iced coffee, right? In case you're curious, by the way, after Turkey, the next biggest consumers of tea per capita in the world are Ireland, the United Kingdom, Russia, and Morocco. And that list should strike you as pretty interesting if you know anything about tea, because there's a country missing from that list that you'd really expect to top the charts. But we'll get to that in a moment. First, let's talk about what tea is and how it's made. Tea! is a beverage. And we sure hope you knew at least that much. Specifically, tea is a beverage made by infusing dried, crushed leaves in boiling water. Now, there are lots of methods for brewing tea, but the basic method is to take loose, whole, dried tea leaves and add them to a pot of water. Boil the water, remove the water from the heat, let it steep for a little while, and then pour the tea through a strainer into a cup for consumption tea drinkers agree that's the best method. But bagged teas have also become very popular, and they grow in popularity very quickly these days. There's been a 15% increase in tea consumption in the last decade alone, and most of those new tea drinkers are using tea bags. 
A tea bag is a small mesh pouch that contains broken up fragments of tea leaves. You dangle the bag in the cup or the teapot and let it steep. Because the leaves are already broken up, the tea brews much more quickly, and you don't have to mess with strainers. Just remove the bag and you're done. The problem is that the oils that give tea its flavor tend to evaporate or degrade once the tea leaves are broken up. So bagged teas tend to be less flavorful and make a weaker tea overall. We're not sure how someone can tell a weak tea from a full flavored tea, considering the lack of flavor and even the boldest of, hey, 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 get on with it. But we digress. Now, you may have heard of all sorts of different types of tea. You may have heard of white tea, green tea, black tea, oolong tea, pu'er tea, for example. But just like there's espresso and dark roast and light roast coffee, which all come from the same plant and are prepared differently, the same is true for tea. All tea comes from one plant, Camellia sinensis. The tea plant is an evergreen plant native to southern and eastern Asia, and all the different types of tea come basically from varied levels of oxidation. All living things, as you know, are made of cells. Basically, those are small, self-contained biological subunits that basically do all of the stuff that is needed to be considered alive. Some organisms consist of just one cell, because one cell is enough to be a living thing. But complex organisms, like people, need lots of different, highly specialized units, tissues, organs, and individual cells, each doing their own job to keep the whole thing alive, right? Now, most living cells are basically the same. But plant cells are special. They're hardy little buggers. And they like to keep to themselves. So every plant cell has a hard outer shell called a cell wall. That wall is made out of cellulose. That's fiber to you. You can't digest it. And it protects the cell's contents from the elements. That's why people get so little nutritional value from raw fruits and vegetables. Chewing doesn't break down the cell walls very well, and they can survive the acids that our stomachs throw at them. Instead, the cells, wall and all, pass through your digestive tract and out again. Along the way, however, the rough fiber scrapes your intestines clean and stimulates the walls of the colon. That's why fiber is so important for regularity. That's also why herbivores have specially adapted teeth and other processes to help them break down the cell walls and get them the nutrients they need from inside every little plant cell. For example, some animals swallow and store rocks in a special internal organ called a gizzard that mills plant matter and breaks up the cellulose. Other animals, like cows, have multiple stage digestive tracts and regurgitate half-digested plant matter for extra chewing before they swallow it. Anyway, the point is that tea leaves have cell walls that keep all the good stuff inside. But eventually, once the plant is dead, those cell walls break down, and once they do, oxygen can get inside and start making a mess of things. See, oxygen is actually a very destructive little chemical. It tends to combine pretty readily with lots of other chemical elements, even if those elements are already in committed relationships. It'll combine with hydrogen and release a lot of energy in the process. That's what fire is. It'll combine with iron, chew it up, and make iron oxide. You call it rust, and so on. Oxygen is actually terrible, which is why it was such a huge disaster billions of years ago when the first green plants started polluting the atmosphere with the stuff. It poisoned and killed off many of the species living on Earth at the time. When oxygen gets inside the cell wall of the tea plant, or really any plant, it starts messing with all of the chemicals inside there. That's why fruit turns brown once you cut it or bruise it. Damage those cell walls, and oxygen gets in and makes a mess. And that's also how tea is made. Or not. Basically, tea production involves a few basic steps. First, you pick the tea leaves you want. Then, you let them wilt a bit, so they soften. Wilting is a result of the cell walls breaking down. The leaf loses its rigidity at this point. Then the leaves are rolled up and wrung out. And then, they are fired to dry them out. The two most common types of teas, green and black, both follow that basic process. The difference is the amount of oxidation that happens. Once the leaves start to wilt, oxygen can enter the cells and start the oxidation process. Black teas are allowed to oxidize for a while before they're rolled up and dried, and they're called black 
because the leaves basically turn brown and then black as they oxidize. And our producer has asked us to basically refer to this only as oxidation and not rotting or composting or spoiling, even though it is exactly the same natural process at work. Tea manufacturers are also picky about their wording. In fact, some still refer to this process as fermentation, even though that's not what's happening at all. So it's oxidation, and we'll all pretend that we don't know what that is. Good. Excellent. Carry on. Unlike black teas, green teas involve very little oxidation. Basically, the leaves are rolled quickly after they wilt to limit the exposure to oxygen. And they are heated up as they are rolled because heat actually slows the oxidation process. That's why cut apples don't turn brown if you bake them. It's also the idea behind blanching vegetables like asparagus. Meanwhile, other teas are made by varying this process. White teas basically involve almost no processing and also use the youngest leaves or buds on the tea plant. They're called white teas because of the white downy wisps of fiber that sometimes appear on the new buds and leaves. Oolong teas are partially oxidized, but their production often involves multiple rolling and oxidation stages. And Pu'er tea is a green tea that's allowed to age and ferment for weeks, months, or even years, usually with the leaves packed in a thick cake. And this is actually fermentation. The tea is being eaten by microbes who produce waste products that add to the tea's flavor. And we're absolutely sure our tea drinking producer would force us to remove any pun we made about microbe waste products and the name Pu'er. But we assure you it would be very funny if we did. Except it wouldn't be because we call that low-hanging fruit and no one enjoys that sort of bathroom humor. So that's how tea is made. But let's get back to that list of the five top tea-consuming countries and what's missing. Because what's missing is not only the country that leads the world in tea production, but also the country in which tea was invented. And in the interest of fairness, we have to point out that while coffee was originally discovered in one of the oldest true political kingdoms in the world, that is, it was one of the oldest places to establish itself as a politically unified entity, tea was discovered by one of the oldest civilizations on Earth. Isn't that swell? See, tea came from China. You probably know that. That's a thing people know, right? And tea was actually discovered by accident by one of eight extremely historically important figures in Chinese history. Well, in pretend Chinese history. See, there's actually two different histories in China. The real one, and the one that makes a better story. The history of China actually stretches back a long, long time. Archaeological evidence suggests that caves scattered all over China were home to ancestral humans, Homo erectus, as far back as two million years ago at the very start of the Paleolithic period, a period known as the Lower Paleoithic, or Old Stone Age. And there are also signs that humanity also started engaging in the basic ritual trappings of culture as far back as 10 or 12,000 years ago in various places in China. You know, stuff we've discussed before, like stacking rocks into microliths and laying their dead to rest. And then came the Neolithic Revolution. That's a term that was first coined by an Australian archaeologist named V. Gordon Child in 1935. He used it to describe the sudden and very rapid period of change that happened in different parts of the world at different times when ancient people started futzing around with agriculture and then, suddenly, civilization was off and running. You know, farming, permanent settlements, the domestication of animals, that sort of stuff. The Neolithic Revolution was all the rage among various people starting at about 12,000 BCE, after the Earth entered an interglacial period of warming, which we're still in today, while they were waiting for the Ice Age to wake up and start rolling glaciers all over everything again. Now, China was having Neolithic revolutions everywhere. There were all sorts of small regional cultures popping up all over the place. But the cultures that were doing the best were the ones living in the valleys along the Yellow River. Because, of course, that's where the good farming was. But they also had a problem. The river kept flooding, like every year. It was a regular thing. Which is why it was where all the good farming was. But it would wreck all the farmland. And that's when, sometime around 2070 BCE, Yu Sha, also known as Yu the Great, founded the first Chinese dynasty. 
The story goes that Yu was so fixated on controlling the flooding of the Yellow River that he worked for 13 years straight on all sorts of measures to control the floods. Like, he supposedly never went home once. And he gathered a lot of helpers and followers. And once the river was under control, the farmers he'd helped had gained a lot of respect for him. Enough respect that he was able to conquer some neighboring folks called the San Mio. In the end, Yu the Great found himself in charge of his corner of the Yellow River Valley. And when he died, his son took over. And thus, he established the concept of dynastic rule, that is, rule by the successors of a particular family line. And as a result, Chinese history, which is pretty fractious and involves the constant unification, expansion, and then separation of various kingdoms, Chinese history is broken down into dynastic periods based on who was in charge. So the Xia dynasty ruled from around 2000 BCE to 1600 BCE. Then, in 1600 BCE, the Xia ruler, Jie, was overthrown by Tang of the Shang clan, and thus began the Shang dynasty, and then came the Zhao dynasty, and so on. Now it's important to note that around the time of the Shang dynasty, Every town and village and region in the lands that were currently China, which was a lot smaller than it is today and basically encompassed the Yellow River Valley and the plains around it, every town and region had its own gods. And there was this idea that particularly great people in life would get deified in the afterlife. You've heard of ancestor worship? Well, that's the basic idea. And complex rituals grew up around the appeasement of ancestral deities as well as making sure that the dead had nice ornate funerals and grand tombs and all the comforts of home so they could enjoy a good afterlife and stay dead. By the time the Zhao dynasty rose to power around 1046 BCE, the king wasn't just a ruler, he was also an intermediary between the living and the dead, including the deified dead ancestors. And so, when the Zhao rebelled against the Shang dynasty, they invoked this idea that if the gods were actually happy with the Shang rule, the rebellion wouldn't be allowed to happen. And so, if the rebellion did happen, and the Zhao claimed the throne, which they did, they were obviously the kings that the gods ordained. And so, by extension, every king of China had a tacit mandate from the gods. But we're getting away from the main story. Here's the thing. Most archaeologists had agreed for a long time that the Xia dynasty and King Yu the Great were probably legendary figures. They were myths, or at least very embellished accounts, and that the dynastic history of China didn't really begin until some time later. But then, in the 1960s and 1970s, a bunch of Bronze Age tombs were discovered that showed the Xia dynasty had been a thing, and China had already started doing the unified culture thing in 2000 BCE. However, there are ancient accounts of even earlier rulers. These were first described in Sima Qian's Records of the Grand Historian, and recorded in about 109 BCE. First, Preceding the Xia dynasty, there were five successive emperors who ruled the kingdoms of China. First was the Yellow Emperor, Huangdi, and he was said to have founded Chinese civilization. He ruled for precisely 100 years, from 2697 BCE to 2597 BCE. Then his grandson took the throne, Zhuan Shu. He created the calendar and invented music. Then came Emperor Ku, the White Emperor, he invented musical instruments, presumably so that there was something to play Emperor Zhuan Shu's music on. And he used to fly around on dragonback. And then there was the wisest king of them all, the sage Yao. And finally, there was Shun the Great. And he accidentally invented tea. We should also mention that before the five emperors, there were also the three august sovereigns. They ruled for a combined 81,000 years. The Heavenly Sovereign came first, and he and his twelve sons divided humanity into different tribes and kept them organized. Then the eleven-headed Earthly Sovereign came and put the sun and the moon in place and created the mountains in China. Then the Human Sovereign came. He drove a chariot made of sky. Yes, the sky. And he also one time got a really nasty cough, and he coughed so hard that the first rice came out. So, rice is god phlegm. 
Presumably brown rice is a particularly nasty chest cold. As you might guess, archaeologists are not convinced that the five emperors and three sovereigns were true historical figures, but you never know. We might discover a tomb with an eleven-headed coffin someday. Who knows? The one figure in all of this that people do agree might have existed was Shen. He's also known as Shen Neng. And one day, he was boiling a pot of water when a bunch of leaves blew in the window from a nearby tree. Shun was just going to throw the water away, but the sweet smell intrigued the possibly non-existent prehistoric emperor. So he took a sip. He felt a warm feeling spreading through his body, as if the liquid was infusing every part of his body. And he named it Chua, which means to investigate. However it was invented, the brew, it was tea in case you're slow on the uptake, became a medicinal brew. It brought the drinker energy and was also thought to help with digestive problems. It spread rapidly. By 200 BCE, it had become a popular beverage, and the emperor of the Han Dynasty had a special written character created for the drink that symbolized the plant, the ground, and humanity because of the way the drink brought humanity into harmony with the natural world. From there, the history of tea is pretty similar to the history of coffee. China tried to control it as a part of their unique heritage, but it spread to neighboring countries. It spread to Tibet, to Japan, to India, and then in the 1600s, it reached both Russia and Europe. And just as the Portuguese did with coffee, eventually, the Netherlands cornered the market on the tea trade for a long time. And it was partly due to the demand for tea imports from China that Britain started the whole opium war thing. That was where they started an illegal drug trade into China to earn enough cash to buy Chinese tea. And it worked until a Chinese official got furious and threw 20,000 chests of opium into the harbor at Canton and dared Britain to go to war with them. Which Britain did. Tea was also a massive export from Britain to its American colonies until Britain started losing too much money on the whole colonization thing and decided to impose massive taxes on such exports, along with many others, to raise some money. And it worked, until a bunch of colonials got furious and threw crates of tea into the harbor at Boston and dared Britain to go to war with them. Which Britain did, after a fashion. So we guess we also have to admit that tea was pretty important in world history and especially American history. And we have to grudgingly admit, maybe tea isn't so bad. Finally, thank you. Especially because after the Boston Tea Party, Dutch and French coffee merchants took the opportunity to flood the American market with inexpensive coffee beans and convince the patriots of the fledgling nation that tea was un-American and unpatriotic and that real Americans drink coffee. Which is what spurred the popularity of coffee in America in the first place. So. Thanks, T. If not for you, coffee wouldn't have its rightful place as the American hot beverage. A position which was contrived and engineered by foreign parties as part of a marketing ploy. Put that in your pot and steep it. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by The Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. 